The door opened quietly and the stable buck put his in his head, a lean negro head lined with pain, the eyes patient. Mr. Slim? Slim took his eyes from old Candy. Huh? Oh, hello, Crooks, what's the matter? You told me to warm up tar for that mule's foot. I got it warm. Oh, sure, Crooks, uh, come, I'll come right out and put it on. I can do it if you want, Mr. Slim. No, I'll do it myself. He stood up. Crooks said, Mr. Slim? Yeah? That big new guy's messing around. Your pup's out in the barn. Well, he ain't doing no harm. I'll give him one of them pups. Just thought I'd tell you, said Crooks. He's taking them out of the nest and handling them. That won't do them no good. He won't hurt them, said Slim. I'll come along with you now. George looked up. If that crazy bastard's fooling around too much, I'll just kick him out, Slim. Slim followed the stable buck out of the room. George dealt and Wit picked up his cards and examined them. Seen the new kid yet? He asked. What kid? Uh, George asked. Why, Curly's new wife. Yeah, I seen her. Well, ain't she a Lulu? I ain't seen that much of her, said George. Wit laid down his cards impressively. Well, stick around and keep your eyes open. You'll see plenty. She ain't concealing nothing. I never seen nobody like her. She got the eye going all the time on everybody. I bet she even gives a stable buck the eye. I don't know what the hell she wants. George asked casually, been any trouble since she got here? It was obvious that Wit was not interested in his cards. He laid his hand down and George scooped it in. George laid out his deliberate solitaire hand, seven cards and six on top and five on top of those. Wit said, I see what you mean. No, they ain't been nothing yet. Curly's got yellow jackets in his drawers, but that's all so far. Every time the guys is around, she shows up. She's looking for Curly, or she thought she left something laying around and she's looking for it. Seems like she can't keep away from guys. And Curly's pants is just crawling with ants, but there ain't nothing coming out of it. George said, she's gonna make a mess. This gonna be a bad mess about her. She's a jailbait all set on a trigger. That Curly got his work cut out for him. Ranch with a bunch of guys on it ain't no place for a girl, especially like her. Wit said, if you got ideas, you ought to come into town with us guys tomorrow night. Why, what's doing? Just the usual thing, we go to old Susie's place. Hell of a nice place. Old Susie's a laugh, always cracking jokes. Like she says when we come up from the front porch last Saturday night. Susie opens the door and then she yells over the, her shoulder, Get your coats on, girls. Here comes the sheriff. She never talks dirty, neither. Got five girls there. What's it say you're back, George asks. Two and a half. You can get a shot for two bits. Susie's got nice chairs to set in two. If a guy don't want to flop, why, you can just sit in the chairs and have a couple of or three shots and pass the time of day and Susie don't give a damn. She ain't rushing guys through and kicking them out if they don't want to flop. Might go in, oh, go in and look the joint over, said George. Sure, come along. It's hell of a lot of fun. Her cracking jokes all the time, like she says one time, she says... I knew people that if they got a rag rug on their floor and a Cupid doll lamp on the phonograph, they think they're running a parlour house. That's Clara's house that she's talking about. And Susie says, I know what you boys want, she says. My girls is clean, she says. And there ain't no water in my whiskey, she says. If any of you guys want to look at a Cupid doll lamp and take your own chance getting burned while you know what, why you know where to go. And she says, there's guys around here walking bow-legged because they like to look at a Cupid doll lamp. George asks, Clara runs the other house, huh? Yeah, we don't never go there. Clara gets 
three bucks a crack and 35 cents a shot and she don't crack no jokes but Susie's place is clean and she got nice chairs don't let no goo goos in neither me and Lenny is rolling up a steak said George I might go and sit and have a shot but I ain't putting out no two and a half well a guy gotta have some fun sometime said Wit the door opened and Lenny and Carlson came in together. Lenny crept to his bunk and sat down, trying not to attract attention. Carlson reached under his bunk and brought out his bag. He didn't look at Candy, who still faced the wall. Carlson found a little cleaning rod in the bag and a can of oil. He laid them on the bed and then brought out the pistol, took out the magazine and snapped the loaded shell from the chamber. Then he fell to cleaning the barrel with the little rod. When the ejector snapped, Candy turned over and looked for a moment at the gun before he turned back to the wall again. Carlson said casually, Curly been in yet? No, said Whip. What's eating on Curly? Carlson squinted down the barrel of his gun, looking around for his old lady. I seen him going round and round outside. Whip said sarcastically, he spends half his time looking for her, and the rest of the time she's looking for him. Curly burst into the room excitedly. Any of you guys see my wife? he demanded. She ain't been here, said Whit. Curly looked threateningly about the room. Where the hell Slim? Went out in the, guard, uh, in the barn, said George. He was going to put some tar on a split hoof. Curly's shoulders drooped and squared. How long ago did he go? Five, ten minutes? Curly jumped out the door and banged it after him. Wit stood up. I guess maybe I'd like to see this, he said. Curly's just spoiling or he wouldn't start for Slim. And Curly's handy, goddamn handy, got in the finals for the Golden Gloves. He got newspaper clippings about it. He considered, but just the same, he better leave Slim alone. Nobody don't know what Slim can do. Think Slim's with his wife, don't he, said George. Looks like it, said Wit. Of course, Slim ain't. At least I don't think Slim is. But I'd like to see the fuss if it comes off. Come on, let's go, George said. I'm staying right here. I don't want to get mixed up in nothing. Lenny and me are going to make a steak. Carlson finished the cleaning of the gun and put it in the bag and pushed the bag under his bunk. I guess I'll go out and look her over. Old Candy lay still and Lenny from his bunk watched George cautiously. When Wit and Carlson were gone, the door closed after them. George turned to Lenny. What you got on your mind? I ain't done nothing, George. Slim says I better not pet them pups for a while. Slim says it ain't good for them, so I come right in. I've been good, George. I could have told you that, said George. Well, I wasn't hurting them none. I just had mine in my lap petting it, George asked. Did you see Slim out in the gun barn? Sure I did. He told me I'd better not pet that pup no more. Did you see that girl? You mean Curly's girl? Yeah. Did she come in the barn? No. Anyways, i never seen her. You never seen Slim talking to her? Uh-uh. She ain't been in the barn. Okay said George. I guess them guys ain't gonna see no fight. If there's any fighting, Lenny, you keep out of it. I don't want no fight, said Lenny. He got up from his bunk and sat down at the table across from George. Almost automatically, George shuffled the cards and laid out his solitaire hand. He used a deliberate, thoughtful slowness. Lenny reached for a face card and studied it, and then turned it upside down and studied it. Both ends the same, he said. George, why is it both ends the same? I don't know, said George. That's just the way they make them. What was Slim doing in the barn when you seen him? Slim? Sure, you seen him in the barn and he told you not to pet the putts so much. Oh, yeah. And he had a can uh, and a, a tar and a paintbrush. I don't know what for. Are you sure that girl didn't come in like she came in here today? No, she never come. George sighed. You give me a good whorehouse every time, he said, and a guy can go and get drunk and get everything out of his system all at once and no messes, and he knows how much it's going to send him back. 
But th these here jail baits is just set on the trigger of a hooskow. Lenny followed his words admiringly and moved his lips a little to keep up. George continued, You remember Andy Cushman, Lenny? Went to the grammar school. The one with that his old lady used to make hotcakes for the kids? Lenny asked. Yeah, that's the one. You can remember anything if there's anything to eat in it. George looked carefully at the solitaire hand. He put an ace up on his scoring rack and piled a two, a three and a four of diamonds on it. And he's in St. Quentin's right now on account of a tart, said George. Lenny drummed on the table with his fingers. George? Yeah? George, how long is it going to be till we get that little place and live on the fat of the land and rabbits? I don't know, said George. We've got to get a big stake together. I know a little place we can get cheap, but they ain't giving it away. Old Candy turned slowly over. His eyes were wide open. He watched George carefully. Lenny said, Tell about the place, George. I, I just told you, just last night. Go on, George. Tell again, George. Well, it's ten acres, said George. And got a little windmill. Got a little shack on it and a chicken run. Got a kitchen, orchard, cherries, apples, peaches, cots, nuts. Got a few berries. And there's a place for alfalfa and plenty of water to flood it. And there's a pig pen. And rabbits, George. No place for rabbits now, but I could easily build a few hutches and you could feed alfalfa to the rabbits. Damn right I could, said Lenny. You got damn right I could. George's hand stopped working with the cards. His voice was growing warmer. And we could have a few pigs, and I could build a smokehouse like the one Grandpa had. And when we kill a pig, we could smoke the bacon and the hams and make sausage and all, all like that. And when the salmon run up the river, we could catch a hundred of them and salt them down and smoke them. We could have them for breakfast. They ain't nothing so nice as smoked salmon. When the fruit come in, we could can it. And tomatoes, they're so easy to can. Every Sunday we'd kill a chicken or a rabbit. Maybe we'd have a cow or a goat. And the cream is so goddamn thick you could cut it with a knife and take it with a spoon. Lenny watched him with wide eyes. And old Candy watched him too. Lenny said softly, We could live off of the fat of the land. Sure, said uh, George. And all kinds of vegetables in the garden. And if we want a little whiskey, we can sell a few eggs or something and some milk. We'd just live there. We'd belong there. There'll be no more running round the country and getting fed by a Jap cook. No, sir. We'd have our own place where we belonged and not sleep in no bunkhouse. Tell about the house, George, Lenny begged. Sure, we'd have a little house and a room to ourselves, A little fat iron stove and in the winter we'd keep a fire going in it. It ain't enough land so that we'd have to work too hard, maybe six, seven hours a day. We wouldn't have to buck no barley eleven hours a day. And when we put in the crop, why, we'd be there to take the crop up. We'd know what come of our planting. And rabbits, Lenny said eagerly. And I'd take care of them. Tell how that would, I'd do that, George. Sure, you go out in the alfalfa patch and you'd have a sack. And you'd fill up the sack and bring it and put it in the rabbit cages. They'd nibble and nibble and they'd nibble, said Lenny. The way they do, I seen them. Every week, six weeks or so, George continued, them does uh, would throw a litter and we'd have plenty of rabbits and eat them and to sell. Uh, and we'd keep a few pigeons to go flying around the windmill like they'd done when I was a kid. He looked raptly over the wall, over Lenny's head. And it'd be our own, and nobody could can us. If we don't like a guy who could say, get the hell out. And by God, he'd have to do it. And if a friend come along, why, we'd have an extra bunk, and we'd say, why didn't you spend the night? And by God, he would. We'd have to uh, set a dog and could... Um, couple of striped cats and you could watch them cats don't get the little rabbits. Lenny breathed hard. 
Yeah, just let them try to get the rabbit. I'll break their goddamn necks. I'll, 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 I'll smash them with their stick. He subsided and, grumbling to himself, threatening the future cats which might disturb the uh, future rabbits, George sat entranced with his own picture. When Candy spoke, they both jumped as though they had been caught doing something reprehensible. Candy said, y You know, you where a place like that? George was on guard immediately. Suppose I do, he said. What's that to you? Y you don't need to tell me where it's at. It might be any place. Sure, said George. That's right. You couldn't find it in a hundred years. Candy went on excitedly. How much they want for a place like that? George watched him suspiciously. Well, I could get it for 600 bucks. The old people that owns it is a flat bust and the old lady needs an operation. Say, what's it to you? You got nothing to do with us. Candy said, I ain't much good with only one hand. I lost my hand right here on this ranch. That's why they give me the job swamping. And they give me $250 because I lost my hand. And I got 50 more saved right up in the bank right now. That's 300 And I got 50 more coming at the end of the month. Tell you what, he leaned forward eagerly. Suppose I went in with you guys. That's 350 bucks I put in. Ain't much good, but I could cook and tend the ki chickens and hoe the garden some. How'd that be? George half closed his eyes. I gotta think about that. We was always gonna do it by ourselves. Candy interrupted him. I, I, I'd make a will and leave my share to you guys in case I kick off, cause I ain't got no relatives or nothing. You guys got any money? Maybe we could do it right now. George spat on the floor disgustedly. We got 10 bucks between us. Then he said thoughtfully, look, if me and Lenny work a month and don't spend nothing, we'll have a hundred bucks. That'd be 450. I bet we could swing it for that. Then you and Lenny could go and get us started and I'd get a job and make up the rest and you could sell eggs and stuff like that. They fell into silence. They looked at one another amazed. This thing they'd never really believed in was coming true. George said reverently, Jesus Christ, I bet we could swing her. His eyes were full of wonder. I bet we could swing her, he repeated softly. Candy sat on the edge of the bunk. He scratched the wrist, stump of his wrist nervously. I got hurt four years ago, he said. They'll can me pretty soon. Just as soon as I can't swamp out no bunkhouses, they'll put me on the county. Maybe if I, I give you guys my money, you'll let me hoe in the garden even if I ain't no good at it. And I'll wash dishes and, and a little chicken and st stuff like that. Uh, uh, but I'll be on my own, our own place uh, and I'll let uh, I'll be let to work on our own place he said miserably you seen what they done to my dog tonight they says he wasn't no good to himself nor nobody else when they can me here I wish somebody would shoot me but they won't do nothing like that I won't have no place to go and I can't get no more jobs I'll have thirty dollars more coming time you guys is ready to quit. George stood up. We'll do her, he said. We'll fix up that little old place and we'll go and live there. He sat down again. They all sat still, all bemused by the beauty of the thing. Each mind was popped into the future when this lovely thing should come about. George said wonderingly, suppose there was a carnival or a circus come to town or a ball game or any damn thing. Old Candy nodded in appreciation of the idea. We'd just go to her, George said. We wouldn't ask nobody if we could. We'd just say, we'll go to her. And we would. Just milk the cow and sling some grain to the chickens and go to her. And put some grass to the rabbits, Lenny broke in. I would never forget to feed them. When we're going to do it, George? In one month, right smack in one month. Know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna write to them old people that owns the place and will, that will take it. And Candy will s send a hundred dollars to bind her. Sure will, said Candy. They got a good stove there? Sure, 
You've got a nice stove, burns coal and or wood. I'm going to take my pup, Lenny said. I bet by Christ he likes it there by Jesus. The voices were approaching from outside. Lenny said quickly, don't tell nobody about it. Just us three and nobody else. They're liable to can us, so we can't make no steak. Just go on like we're going to buck barley for the rest of our lives. Then all of a sudden, someday, we'll get our pay and scram out of here. Lenny and Candy nodded, and they were grinning with delight. Don't tell nobody, Lenny said to himself. Candy said, George, huh? I ought to have shot that dog myself, George. I shouldn't have ought to let no stranger shoot my dog. The door opened. Slim came in, followed by Curly and Carlson and Whip. Slim's hands were black with tar and, he, tar was, and he was scowling. Curly hung close to his elbow. Curly said, Well, I didn't mean nothing, Slim. I just asked you. Slim said, Well, you've been asking me too often. I'm getting goddamn sick of it. If you can't look after your own goddamn wife, what do you expect me to do about it? You lay off of me. I'm just trying to tell you I didn't mean nothing, said Curly. I just thought you might have saw her. Why don't you go and tell her to stay the hell home where she belongs, said Carlson. You let her hang around the bunkhouses and pretty soon you're going to have something on your hands and you won't be able to do nothing about it. Curly whirled on Carlson. You keep out of this unless you want to step outside. Carlson laughed. You goddamn punk, he said. You try to throw a scare into Slim and you can make it stick. Slim throw the scare into you. You yeller as a frog belly. I don't care if you're the best welter in the country. You come for me, I'll kick your goddamn head off. Candy joined the attack with joy. Go for the Vaseline, he said disgustedly. Curly glared at him. His eyes slipped on past and lighted on Lenny. Lenny was still smiling with delight at the memory of the ranch. Curly stepped over to Lenny like a terrier. What the hell are you laughing at? Lenny looked blankly at him. Huh? Then Curly's rage exploded. Come on, you big bastard! Get up on your feet! No big son of a bitch is gonna laugh at me! I'll show you who's yeller! Lenny looked on helplessly at George, and then he got up and tried to retreat. Curly was balanced and poised. He slashed at Lenny with his left, and then smashed down his nose with the right. Lenny gave a cry of terror. Blood welled from his nose. George! He cried. Make uh, um, let me alone, George! He backed until he was against the wall and Curly followed, slugging him in the face. Lenny's hands remained at his sides. He was too frightened to defend himself. George was on his feet yelling. Get him, Lenny! Don't let him do it! Lenny covered his face with his huge paw and bleated with terror. He cried, Make him stop, George! Then Curly attacked on his stomach and cut off his wind. Slim jumped up. You dirty little rat, he cried. I'll get him myself. George put up his hand and grabbed Slim. Wait a minute, he, saw, uh, he shouted. He cupped his hands around his mouth and yelled, Get him, Lenny! Lenny took his hands away from his face and looked about for George and Curly slashed at his eyes. The big face was covered with blood. George yelled again, I said, Get him! Lenny's fist was swinging when Lenny... Curly's fist was swinging when Lenny reached for it. The next moment, Curly was flopping like a fish on the line and his closed fist was lost in Lenny's big hand. George ran down the room. Let go of him, Lenny! Let go! But Lenny watched in terror in the flopping little man whom he held. Blood ran down Lenny's face. One of his eyes was cut and closed. George slapped him in the face again and again, but still Lenny held on to the closed fist. Curly was white and shrunken by now, and his struggling began to become weak. He stood crying, his fist lost in Lenny's paw. George shouted over and over, Let go his hand, Lenny! Let go! Slim, come help me while the guy's got any hand left. Suddenly, Lenny let go of his hold. He crouched, cowering against the wall. You told me to, George, he said miserably. Curly sat on the floor, looking in wonder at his crushed hand. Slim and Carlson bent over him. Then Slim straightened up and regarded with Lenny with horror. We've got to get him to a doctor, he said. Looks to me like every bone in his hand is bust. I didn't want to, Lenny cried. I didn't want to hurt him, Slim said. 
Carlson, you get the candy wagon hitched up. We'll take him in solid out and get him fixed up. Carlson hurried out. Slim turned to the whimpering Lenny. It ain't your fault that this, he said, this punk sure had it coming to him. But Jesus, he ain't hardly got no hand left. Slim hurried out and in a moment returned with a tin of cup of water. He held it to Curly's lips. George said, Slim, will we get canned now? We need the steak. Will Curly's old man can us now? Slim smiled wryly. wryly. He knelt beside Curly. You got your senses in your hand enough to listen, he asked. Curly nodded. Well then, listen, Slim went on. I think you got your hand caught in a machine. If you don't tell nobody what happened, we ain't going to. But just you go and try and tell, get this guy can, and we'll tell everybody. And then you, will you get the laugh? I won't tell, said Curly. He avoided looking at Lenny. Buggy wheels sounded outside. Slim helped Curly up. Come on now, Carlson's going to take you to the doctor. He helped Curly out the door. The sounds of the wheels drew away. In a moment, Slim came back into the bunkhouse. He looked at Lenny, still crouched fearfully against the wall. Let's see your hands, he asked. Lenny stuck out his hands. Christ almighty, I'd hate to have you mad at me, Slim said. George broke in. Lenny was just scared, he explained. He didn't know what to do. I told you nobody ever, never ought to fight him. No, I guess it was Candy, I told. Candy nodded solemnly. That's just what you done, he said. Right this morning when Curly first lit into your friend, you said, he better not fool with Lenny if he knows what's good for him. That's just what you says to me. George turned to Lenny. It ain't your fault, he said. You don't need to be scared no more. You just done what you, I told you to. Maybe you better go to the washroom and clean up your face. You look like hell. Lenny smiled with a bruised mouth. I didn't want no trouble, um, he said. He walked toward the door, but just before he came to it, he turned back. George, what do you want? I can still tend the rabbit, George. Sure, you ain't done nothing wrong. I didn't mean no harm, George. Well, get the hell out and wash your face. End of chapter three.